Hello friends, this video on neat evolution is brought to you by examfear.com. No more fear from ex Question number 5. What was the most significant trend in the evolution of modern man? Homo sapiens from his ancestors. So if you look at the uh, entire evolution of modern man, you, you would see that there were a lot of changes which had taken place over a period of time. So which one was the most significant trend? So the most significant trend was of course the increasing brain capacity. So if you look at the ancestors of Homo sapiens like Homo habilis was like the first form of man ancestors for the modern day man and if you look at the brain capacity of Homo habilis it was around 700 cc whereas if you look at the brain capacity of Homo sapiens it is more than 1600 cc so it is 1600 cc plus so it is more than 1600 cc so you know there is a huge increase in the brain capacity so here on the right hand side i have just drafted the various stages of evolution of man and here also you can see uh, like how the brain capacity changed with each stage question number six the extinct human who lived 100,000 to 40,000 years ago in Europe, Asia and large parts of Africa with short stature, heavy eyebrows, retreating foreheads, large jaws with heavy teeth, stocky bodies, a lumbering gait and stooped posture was. So which was, which phase of human evolution was this? So just looking at these features, you will have to decide. So yes, this was the Neanderthal map, human. So what are the different properties of Neanderthal human? They, even though they walked upright like the Homo sapiens, but they had a smaller chin, sloping forehead, thick bone skull. Uh, when you look at the brain capacity of Neanderthal man, they had a brain capacity of 1400 cc. Now, why were they called Neanderthal man? Do you know that? Because they were first found from, they were first obtained, the fossils were first obtained from the Neander Valley in Germany. So after the name of that valley, they were named Neanderthal man. Now there was one uh, issue with the Neanderthal man that their diet had did not have sufficient iodine. So iodine deficiency diet caused a disease called cretinism and skeletal deformities. And as a result, most of them disappeared quite rapidly. So they did not live for a long time. So why they did not live for a long time? Because they suffered from a disorder called cretinism where they had skeletal deformities. And this happened due to deficiency of iodine in their diet. Question number seven, Peripatus is a connecting link between Tenophora and Platyhelminths, Mollusks and Echinodermata, Annelida and Arthropoda, Cylentrata and Porifera. So Peripatus is a living fossil. It looks like a caterpillar, like as you see on the screen. So that's a Peripatus. And it is a connecting link between the annelids and the arthropods. So it has annelid-like characters as well as arthropod-like characters. So if you look at its, so if you look at its annelid like characters, so let us look at some of the characters which are similar to the annelids, like it has unjoined legs, the presence of nephridia which acts as the excretory organ, presence of internal segmentation on the body. So all of these resembled annelids, whereas if you look at its arthropod like characters, those characters which resembled the arthropods. So what were they like the presence of claws, the jaws, presence of trachea, the door, presence of a dorsal tubular heart. So all of these resembled the arthropods. Now since peripatus has uh, features of both annelids and arthropods, so it was like a link between the annelids and the arthropods and that is why it is called a connecting link between annelids and arthropods. Question number eight. Darwin's finches are an excellent example of adaptive radiation, seasonal migration, brood parasitism and connecting link. So if you look at the story of the Darwin's finches, what does the story tell us? 
So what happened to the Darwin's finches? So we saw that in the Galapagos Islands, there were a few Darwin, few finches which initially arrived. And then over a period of time from those finches, many more finches were formed. Now, how do the, how new, this new species were formed? With small, small changes that took place just for their survival. And with all of that, eventually from one species of finch, we, it, it reached to about 15, 20 species of the finches. So that way we can say that it is an example of adaptive radiation. So it was definitely not a seasonal migration. It was not that the finches came to that island for some time and then again went back to another place. So it wasn't like that. So it was not a seasonal migration. It was also not a connecting link because these finches were not having characteristics of two different, uh, you know, two different species that it was a connecting link between those two. That wasn't true. It was also not an example of brood parasitism. So brood parasitism is that phenomenon where um, a, a particular group of organisms, they do not want to spend time and energy to raise up their kids and therefore they give that duty to some other organism. So that's brood parasitism. So in this case, it was an example of uh, adaptive radiation because we know adaptive radiation is evolution of different species in a given area starting from a point and then radiating to other areas like how it happened in the Galapagos Islands. So first a few finches came and then from those few finches they you know started to reproduce and increase in number. Now initially they used to feed on seeds. Now when they, they increased in number they felt that they cannot rely on just one source of food. So some of the finches started eating worms as well. So those which started feeding on worms, they started having a longer beak when compared to the others who were feeding on seeds. So over a period of time, both of these varieties started to reproduce and it was found that we had two different species of finches. And in a similar way, more and more uh, variations happened and more and more uh, species of finches came. So starting from one type of finch in a particular area, many other species arose and this is called adaptive radiation. So option A is the right one. Question number nine. Which one of the following statements is correct? First option, stem cells are specialized cells. Well, stem cells are not specialized cells. In fact, stem cells are the undifferentiated cell of multicellular organisms which are capable of giving rise to infinitely more cells of the same type. And these stem cells, they differentiate to form specialized cells. So what are specialized cells? Those cells which have a specific function to, I mean, specific function to perform. Whereas undifferentiated cells are the stem cells. So they do not, stem cells do not perform a function. They basically, they continue to divide to form more and more cells like them. And then those cells, they act as the specialized cells. So first option is not correct. Option B, there is no evidence of the existence of gills during embryogenesis of mammals. Well, this is also incorrect because if you look at the process of embryogenesis, that is formation and development of embryo of an organism. So gill slits were very well present during the embryogenesis. Option C, all plant and animal cells are totipotent. So what do we mean by totipotent? What is totipotency? So totipotency is the ability to divide. So it is the ability to divide. Now, do you think that all plant and animal cells have the ability to divide? Well, all plant and animal cells do not have the ability to divide. For example, let's talk about the stem cells. Just now in option A, we were discussing about stem cells. So stem cells have the ability to divide. So stem cells are totipotent, but that doesn't mean that all the cells in our body are totipotent. Similarly, if you talk about plants, so in established plants, in like fully grown up plants, only the meristematic cells, the meristem cells, they are totipotent. And that is why you can see them growing. You can see them giving rise to more and more cells like the stems grow, the roots grow. So they th that growth happens because of the meristem cells. So only some cells are totipotent, but not all plant and animal cells are totipotent. 
Option D, ontogeny repeats phylogeny. Well, yes, that's true because this is the biogenetic law. So we already learned about this law. So this is the right option. And this law is the biogenetic law, which tells us that uh, during the development of an individual organism from the earliest stage to maturity, the organism passes through its ancestral phases or it passes through its evolutionary history. Question number 10. When two species of different genealogy come to resemble each other as a result of adaptation, the phenomenon is termed, so two species of different genealogy. What is genealogy? That means of different genetic makeup. So two unrelated groups basically, but they resemble each other as a result of adaptation. So just for their survival, so for their survival, they made some changes to their body such that they kind of started resembling each other in some form. So what is that phenomenon called? So remember it in this way, different species, not the related species, but they all reach at a common point. So what is happening here? They are converging. So this is an example of convergent evolution. Thank you. Please visit examfear.com for free quality education. You can learn with a simple four-step learning process wherein you can watch video lessons, you can ask your questions, you can refer notes and you can take a free online test. We have content for class 6 to 12 on physics, chemistry, mathematics and biology along with practical videos. So please subscribe to our channel for daily updates. Thank you.